Uh, just some relevant disclosures. I do have some funding relating to development of biomarkers for uh, risk stratification of lung nodules, and we may mention that briefly at the end of this talk. So just to pick up where uh, Andy Haas left off, I think it's important to recognize that in the various screening trials that are ongoing, um, what we see in terms of, I think, outcomes that we would like to avoid. So this is the National Lung Screening Trial and all the other trials that Andy mentioned. And as you can see, this is the percent of patients with lung nodules at baseline. So in the National Lung Screening Trial, we saw a baseline lung nodule rate of anything four millimeters or greater of 25%. And that really sort of fairly stable across all these studies, though there is some variability. This is the number of patients, patients undergoing a surgical lung biopsy in those trials. So somewhere between you know, one and three, if not four percent of patients ultimately had a surgical lung biopsy for a diagnosis. This is a pretty high rate if you're thinking about all the patients who may be screened and may ultimately need a diagnosis for an indeterminate lung nodule. This in the middle is a percent of patients who had a surgical lung biopsy who ultimately ended up having benign disease. They never even had cancer. This rate varied from 25 percent in the NLST all the way up to as high as 45 percent in some of these controlled trials. So uh, very high rates. Um, and so I think it's very important to think about strategies to manage patients with lung nodules. I um, tend to be more conservative than the average person, and we'll talk about what, for some of those reasons why. This is a, uh, a really nice paradigm, I think, for thinking about how to decide what to do with a lung nodule, published by Austin Gold in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine a couple of years ago now. I'm going to walk us through this just briefly because I like it. Um, here is the probability of cancer for an individual lung nodule ranging from zero to 100%. And this is sort of various thresholds to think about what to do. So if the probability of malignancy is low, Gould and Ost sort of use an arbitrary cutoff of 5%, but this, this, this can sort of vary depending on where you think the right line is. You observe and you do serial, serial imaging. If the probability of malignancy is sort of intermediate, and so they range somewhere in that range of between 5 and 65 percent or so uh, in their recommendations. You think about additional diagnostic testing using things like PET scan, and we'll come back to PET scan in a little bit, CT-guided FNA, bronchoscopy, to establish a diagnosis. If your prior probability of malignancy is very high, and they, again, they use this arbitrary threshold of 65 percent, but it could be higher depending on where you are, um, going straight to surgery for a surgical diagnosis and treatment. These lines, of course, vary, and they vary based on a variety of factors. The, if this line could sort of move in one direction, if the patient's a very high surgical risk patient, you probably don't want to operate on them unless they're super high risk, so you want to move this line over to the right. Patient preferences come into play, so if people are very concerned about living with a lung nodule, you may move that line, and they absolutely have to have an answer, you may move that line. Or if patients are more comfortable with a conservative approach, a watchful waiting approach, these lines may move as well. So just an overall paradigm to sort of have in the back of your mind as we go forward. Okay, so how do we define, am I allowed to back up this one? Ah, great. So how do we define this line as sort of what I'm gonna spend the next few slides on? How do you define the prior probability of malignancy in a person with an indeterminate nodule? So of course, these are the most important factors to consider, and some of these are fairly obvious. Nodule size, smoking history, age, family history, concomitant emphysema. Probably the five most important factors to think about when you're trying to estimate what the probability of malignancy is for a specific nodule. And so I'm not gonna review this paper in great detail, though, just published a couple of months ago. This was a very large sort of set of trials from Canada uh, where they had a number of lung nodules identified in high-risk patients. So these were patients who were older and had a significant tobacco history, and they developed a risk prediction model for lung nodules. And I'm gonna walk you through uh, this is probably pretty small text up here, but probably hopefully seen on your screen individually, where at least in this model, you essentially just type these into an Excel spreadsheet that's available online at this website. You, 60, so a hypothetical 64-year-old with emphysema, a 12-millimeter nodule that uh, is in the upper lobe but not speculated. And if you were to punch this through based on their prediction model, you get a probability of malignancy of 12.7%. And so I don't use calculators all the time in my practice, but I think it's important to think about using these more often because while many of us are experts in this area and can, can probably get a reasonable determination of the prior probability of malignancy, oftentimes we're quite wrong. And it's important to think about turning to a risk prediction model to help us think about what the probability of malignancy is for an individual patient with an individual nodule. Um, 
And I guess the last thing I'll mention is, at least in this particular model, there are other ones available as well. You don't see smoking history here because this is a population of very high risk smokers, patients who had smoked over 20 pack years. And so certainly models vary depending on the population. And so you need to think about which model is right for your practice. Uh, but I have started to use this a little bit in my own practice. And we'll come back to that model in a little while. So let's think a little bit more about nodule size. Again, this is really recently published data in September from the National Lung Screening Trial. And what I've what I've done here is broken down the nodules that were identified by low dose CT in this column, whether they were confirmed to be lung cancer or not during the course of the National Lung Screening Trial, and what I would call the positive predictive value of that nodule size predicting cancer. I'm amazed by this data. I really am. Because I would think that most people who have a 30 millimeter or greater nodule would have cancer most of the time. But if you look at the probability of malignancy in those nodules, it was only 41% in the, in the trial. That's amazing to me. This is a small number. I recognize a relatively small data set. But but less than half of these patients had lung cancer. They all had, they, more of them had benign disease. And so as we think about detection of lung nodules in asymptomatic patients and what size means, I think it's important to think about, about this data here, and that most people, just based on size alone in a high-risk population for over 55 and 30 pack years, you're still less likely to have cancer at all of these sizes. Uh, and that should sort of inform your decision-making about what you're gonna do for that patient. All right, so many of you are familiar with the Fleischner criteria, the Fleischner guidelines published in 2005. I'm not gonna review them in great detail, but they really sort of help you decide what to do or at least recommend what to do for small nodules. I think many of us follow these guidelines. These guidelines are, of course, pretty in line with what we know about the risk of malignancy here, right? So based on the data I just showed you, the risk of malignancy in small nodules is very low, so it's very appropriate to use a strategy of serial imaging. And so I'm not gonna go through the various categories, but in quote unquote the higher risk, highest risk category, pe people with a smoking history or other risk factors for lung cancer, you would image them at three to six months for a six to eight millimeter nodule, less often for smaller nodules or lower risk patients. For patients with greater than an eight millimeter nodule, the recommendations really are to consider PET and or biopsy or re-image them in three months. And I think that my only quibble with the Fleischer guidelines perhaps is that I think that this leaves a lot of people thinking that if you have something over eight millimeters, you've got to do something, that you've got to go in and try and biopsy it, you've got to go in and do surgery. Um, but I think that, don't forget that a watchful waiting strategy where you re-image in three months is a very reasonable approach in a patient who is somewhere in the low to intermediate risk category, uh, recognizing that we don't always know what the natural history of waiting three months leads to, but we think it's a relatively right, safe strategy for many patients. So I'm going to take a little tangent here and talk a little bit about the latest Fleischner guidelines, which came out earlier this year for subsolid nodules or ground glass nodules, uh, led by David Nadich um, and other colleagues. And it's probably worth reviewing briefly because this is a relatively recent development in terms of guidelines for lung nodules. So let's just walk through them very quickly. For a solitary pure ground glass nodule, it's less than five millimeters in size. The recommendation is for no additional CT follow-up. The one caveat here is that if you're going to judge whether a nodule is solid versus ground glass, it's important to get thin cut CT. So in the, in the setting of thick cut CTs, five millimeter cuts, something that looks like ground glass is actually a solid nodule based on thin cut CT. So I think that the standard of care for all lung nodule management really should be to use thin cut CT to determine what the nodule is. Is it speculated? What its size is? Is it solid? Is it ground glass? For, so, for solitary ground glass nodules of greater than five millimeters in size, the recommendation is for an initial CT at three months, followed by annual surveillance for a minimum of three years if that nodule is stable. Now, some people have quibbled over the three-month recommendation. Why are you doing something relatively aggressive in terms of rescanning at three months when solid nodules that are even larger can be reimaged at, at six-month intervals? And the reason for that, uh, forgot to mention a couple of things. So ground glass nodules, of course, are, are, are concerning because they may represent pre-invasive atypical adenomatous hyperplasia or early adenocarcinoma in situ. About 20% of ground glass nodules are benign, um, and growth of a ground glass nodule is certainly suggestive of an invasive adenocarcinoma. Uh, but why image at three months? And the reason for that is that you can certainly see growth in three months. This is a very subtle growth at three months, and this ended up being an adenocarcinoma in situ. But you can also have cases like this, where you start off with a very subtle ground glass nodule. In three months, it's formed a solid component. In six months, it's become a large invasive adenocarcinoma. Uh, 
So for ground glass nodules over five millimeters in size, we recommend starting at three months uh, with subsequent follow-up to at least three years afterwards if they're stable. The last recommendation for solitary ground glass nodules is that for a solitary part solid nodule, uh, image at three months, and if the, and if the solid component um, is less than five millimeters, you can be fairly conservative, but if the solid component increases or is greater than five millimeters, then consider biopsy and surgery. And the reason for that is that we know that these mixed nodules, the ones that are half ground glass and half solid, have a very high probability of being adenocarcinoma uh, and should be managed accordingly. I think I just said that. Okay, and they have a, a number of other recommendations for subsolid nodules if there are multiple subsolid nodules present. I won't go through these in any great detail, except to maybe mention the last one, is that if you have uh, multiple ground glass nodules where one is the dominant lesion, you should make all your, all your decisions really based on that dominant lesion. Um, and I'll show you an example. So this is a person at four different cuts from one patient. This is the dominant lesion here, it looks relatively, uh, at least uh, looks partly solid. They have a number of other ground glass lesions present as well in other locations and other lobes. Um, try not to be distracted by these. Make a decision on treatment based on this, whether that might include surgery, uh, a limited resection, or radiation, and then continue to follow the ground glass nodules per recommendations um, uh, in, in this paper. PET scans, we love PET scans. Uh, certainly PET scans are helpful in that they can help identify whether the dominant lesion itself has, is hypermetabolic and perhaps then more suggestive of malignancy. They also help us identify indolent malignant disease in the mediastinum. Uh, and so we use it for both purposes, both for the lung nodule and for the mediastinum. But remember, PET scans are far from perfect. Their sensitivity and specificity for lung nodule for the primary lesion is somewhere in the 80s, certainly not anywhere uh, in the 90s or near 100. Uh, they're less accurate for smaller lesions, and we're going to see a lot of smaller lesions with screening. They're less accurate for subsolid nodules. We're going to see a lot of subsolid nodules with screening. So if you're going to use PET scans, do. Just remember what their, uh, what their limitations are when you use them for decision-making in, in this patient population. If you need a tissue diagnosis, you certainly will move some, for, some patients forward to, uh, to biopsy. And so just remember a couple key, I think, data points. One is that traditional bronchoscopy, that is without navigation, the yield of traditional bronchoscopy for a screen-detected peripheral nodule is terrible, 15%, perhaps less. And so probably not worth moving forward with a traditional bronchoscopy. Navigational bronchoscopy has been reported, including Dr. Silvestri's recent meta-analysis, to have a sensitivity of 70%. My guess is that there is some degree of reporting bias in that certainly my experience with navigation has not really achieved 70%. It's reasonable, but we can certainly have a long way to go to getting to better accuracies with navigational bronchoscopy for peripheral lesions, but certainly something to consider uh, if there are characteristics that suggest a, a reasonable yield, including uh, a bronchus sign showing an airway leading to a nodule. CT-guided trans needle biopsy or CT-guided FNA has been reported to have a sensitivity of 90%. Again, there is some reporting bias here, right? You can only report on people you've done, you've chosen to actually take forward to biopsy, so uh, you have to sort of consider size and location uh, and uh, skill of your operator, uh, but certainly probably has a higher diagnostic accuracy than bronchosco navigational bronchoscopy at this point. But remember that if you're going to move forward CT guided TTNA, the reported pneumothorax risk here is significant, 15 to 30 percent, depending on what you read. With about six percent of all patients having a, having uh, who are having a TTNA requiring a, a chest tube. Uh, Do we skip one? A little frozen here. Oh, conclusions, and we'll, get, we'll come to my question. I don't know if we're going to do it after or not. Uh, so lung nodules are increasingly common. We're going to see more lung nodules with screening. Uh, it's certainly something we didn't talk about, but important to elicit patient preferences um, in the decision-making process. Uh, management should include an estimation of cancer risk, whether you do this by gestalt, uh, if you're comfortable doing so, or whether you use a risk, a, a nodule risk calculator, which I uh, am increasingly doing. Nodules less than eight millimeters in size are infrequently malignant. I have I don't think I have ever done an invasive procedure for a, a nodule less than eight millimeters in size, and I don't recommend it in the large majority of cases. Uh, 
uh, CT scan surveillance is certainly the best option in, in these patients. Um, if you have a very high likelihood of malignancy and a low surgical risk, you can consider going straight to a surgical evaluation for those patients. Um, and certainly there are emerging tools to help us with, uh, with this, including peripheral blood biomarkers. There are actually a couple on the market now, uh, not incorporated yet into prospective trial data or into guidelines. So I would just say keep a, a lookout for some of these things because they may be uh, beneficial in our decision-making process going forward. Thank you for your attention.